Well, thank you very much, John, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to the IPA for organizing this event. Very intimidating for me because I, I don't know the Australian situation, although I gather from everything that's been said so far that it is more or less the same as the situation in England, except that there seems to be some uh, fragile uh, tendrils of hope still remaining here, uh, which um, is obviously uh, a credit to the, to the uh, air of Australia. Now, I, I, th I was going to talk a little bit about freedom of thought and where it stands today and, and look back also at where it comes from in our civilization. I, I think we should always begin from recognizing that uh, uh, freedom of thought is not the default position of human uh, societies. On the contrary, the default position is an enforced conformity of thought. Uh, uh, and orthodoxies have a, a head start over any kind of criticism of them. Uh, why this is so is, of course, a deep question. It, it relates to our, not just to our social nature, but also to our evolutionary history, uh, that human beings live in communities, they need communities for their protection, uh, and thinking is one of the things that separates people from each other. Uh, and the more you think about other people, the more separate you feel from them, with very good reason as a, as a rule. Uh, uh, and therefore, obviously, uh, the tendency to repress dissident thought is there in all of us. Uh, and freedom of thought has to be fought for. And it is really what distinguishes a civilization from a mere organic horde. And I think that's uh, been the, one of the great achievements of our civilization, that we have succeeded until now in, uh, in gradually expanding the area of free thinking without losing that sense of, uh, of a common destiny and answerability to each other, which is necessary if we are to exist uh, as a civilization at all. Now, I think the first thing to note, and I think it's something that's already been mentioned by Ian Harper, is that uh, our civilization has religious roots. It is rooted in Christianity, but not only in Christianity. Christianity itself grew in very extraordinary conditions in the Middle East, uh, and again, it grew against the background of Roman law. Roman law was remarkable uh, in the ancient world in being a purely secular institution. It didn't, ref it didn't require obedience to any religious, uh, uh, any religious tradition or, any, or, or uh, obedience to any particular gods. It was self-consciously a, self a man-made law used for the government of the empire uh, uh, by uh, uh, the emperor, but also in consultation, of course, with the judicial system which gave rise to it. Uh, it has, as we all know, many defects, but it, it has survived in, in Europe uh, until the modern world. We are lucky if, in the Anglosphere that we are also inheritors of another system of law, the common law, which I'll come to in a minute. But this, um, the fact that Christianity grew under the jurisdiction of the Roman law is not an insignificant fact. Uh, and um, this was made clear by Christ himself in the parable of the tribute money, in which uh, he uh, uh, made the famous remark, uh, at least this is what was attributed to him in St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, uh, advising us to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. In other words, uh, if you interpret it, at least interpret it as St. Paul uh, went on to interpret uh, Christ's message, that we obey the secular law in all that uh, concerns our living together with each other on this earth. Uh, we look to divine law for our own personal salvation and for, this, for the salvation of our souls. We don't allow divine law to sweep away secular law when it comes to adjudicating human conflicts or, or, or regulating our affairs on this earth among each other. And this is a, a rather remarkable thing for the founder of a religion to have said. He is effectively saying that although I come to found a religion and to, and to encourage you to not just to join it, but to save your souls through joining it, although I do that, nevertheless, I, 
I um, command obedience to purely secular authorities who's, who have no um, divine right to, to uh, uh, pass the laws that they pass, but a purely human right, uh, which they have acquired by whatever historical means. And this means that in, in our tradition, sec uh, secular law has always taken precedence over religious law. Uh, and um, there have been conflicts, of course. Nobody can say that the history of Western civilization has been without violence and religious violence in particular. But uh, for the last um, 400 years, that violence has been dwindling or non-existent. This is a remarkable con contrast, of course, with the I Islamic world. And I think because this is very relevant to what's happening now, everybody ought to think about it. Uh, the Islamic law is a holy law. It's laid down by God, uh, or um, at least supposedly laid down by God, through the mouth of his prophet. And the Sharia does not recognize the validity of any secular or man-made law. Uh, and when it's taken seriously, it is given the absolute right to override any man-made law. Uh, and moreover, it's a supposedly a law that applies first and foremost to believers and allows non-believers in only under treaty, uh, the, the Dhimma. Uh, and um, this fact, of course, has never bothered people in the last few hundred years because of the uh, manifest uh, de decline of the, uh, of the Muslim nations, that their ability, inability to impose themselves on others. But that inability has gone. But um, they have uh, taken advantage of the uh, uh, hospitality offered by the by Western states to take up residence within those states, claiming quite rightly uh, uh, as incomers whatever privileges are available to them, but uh, uh, showing a re marked reluctance to accept the ground principle on which our civilization is founded, namely that secular law prevails over religious law, uh, and that um, is leading to conflicts, as we know, in Europe. And, and America, uh, to a, a, a sense among many uh, uh, Muslims, especially younger Muslims who've been deracinated from any uh, uh, traditional society of their own, a sense that somehow the surrounding society in which they find themselves is illegitimate. It's founded on principles which do not have divine authority and which uh, should be not only uh, ignored or, or, or disobeyed when they are in conflict with the individual conscience, but also punished. And I, I think we're now entering a, a new phase in which this, these punishments will be seen more and more often. We have, therefore, to be more uh, conscious than we have been of just what it is that we've inherited in inheriting the secular law. And I w want us to say a, a few little things about that uh, now, uh, and then presumably more things will come out during questions. Uh, it, it's the first important fact about secular law is that it is territorial. A religious jurisdiction does not depend upon territory. It attaches to the individual and governs him wherever he is uh, because he, he uh, belongs elsewhere than the, in this world. It's governing him from a point beyond this world, the point where God uh, keeps eternal vigil on the behavior of his creatures. But um, a secular law can't depend upon an idea like that. It must depend upon uh, a definition of the jurisdiction which can be understood and applied by human beings. And the only definition that we have is the territorial one. People within the territory of the sovereign uh, are entitled to the protection of its law. That idea um, grew within Western civilization during the Middle Ages, led to conflicts, of course, at the Renaissance and the Reformation, but was finally accepted and, and installed as the ground rule of, uh, of the nation state, that the jurisdiction that under which we live is a territorial one. We owe loyalty to that territory, and that's a serious loyalty. 
it can ask, it through the sovereign can ask us to die for it in, in any conflict. Uh, moreover, people in Australia are imbued with a, or have been imbued with an extraordinary capacity to feel this loyalty, not just to the country where they are, but also to the one from which their ancestors came. Uh, and we in Britain know that uh, had it not been for your willingness to fight and die for the old country, we probably would no longer exist. So we know that this is a very powerful loyalty, this loyalty to territory, but it goes with the sense that that territory is properly governed and governed by a law of its own and, a, and, and political procedures of its own which serve, to, as it were, to stitch the law to the land and the land to the law, which is what uh, our inheritance really means to us. Uh, uh, but with this inheritance has come also another uh, bequest of the Middle Ages, which is the idea uh, of uh, human rights. Uh, and I, I know from the excellent things that were said by Janet earlier this morning that this concept of human rights has become as problematic for you as, as it is for everybody else in the Western world. Uh, and it's important to know why. The, the, the concept has its roots, I, I suspect, or historical roots at least, in the medieval theory of the natural law, itself inherited from Roman law. Uh, the, the natural law being the law that is implanted in all of us, um, according to the medievals by God, um, but uh, whether or not we, uh, we accept that, it's implanted in all of us by our nature at least. Uh, and it, it is a, a law which governs our behavior in ways which we cannot escape because uh, this is precisely what it is to be a law-abiding creature, some, a creature that, can, that finds itself answerable to others as a pers one person in a community of persons. That natural law was uh, stated in various ways by Thomas Aquinas and others in the Middle Ages, never very clearly, uh, but it became clear, uh, especially in uh, in my country, in England, during the aftermath of the Reformation, when it was uh, used to formulate existing principles of the common law. Now, the common law is, is something which you've inherited here, uh, and which I think is very um, sparsely understood in the modern world. It is the thing that divides us from the rest of Europe, uh, and which makes it, in the long run, uh, uh, impossible for us to be part of the European Union, although, uh, unfortunately, ignorance of our politicians means that we, they have yet to realize this. The common, the common law it, it is distinct from the systems of law that have grown out of Roman law in, in being a bottom-up system of law. As I say, law emerges in the common law through the resolution of individual conflicts. It's, it's through the resolution of conflicts in the court of law that the law gradually emerges through the system of appeals and so on. Uh, so that the formulation of law comes second, uh, the resolution of conflict comes first. In, in a, the continental systems, in particular those um, that were fabricated in the wake, wake of the French Revolution, the law comes first. It's a decree of the state, uh, which is then applied in the resolution of conflicts. Uh, uh, so that it's a top-down system. Uh, the law has a, a kind of autonomy, uh, which um, allows it to develop on its own, uh, and then, uh, leg and then apply, apply itself, and then it's applied by the courts to the individual case. The bottom-up s s uh, system means that our law starts from the individual. It starts from his complaint, his grievance, what it is that has brought him before, before the court in the first place. He's come before the court in the search of a remedy. And that idea of a remedy is a very in interesting one that's developed in the Middle Ages in, in our uh, courts of law in Britain, in England rather, uh, uh, and produced this extraordinary idea that somehow the individual, until... Uh, um, the, the law decides otherwise, is sovereign over his own life. 
he, he has the right to come before the court and, uh, and bring the sovereign to his side in any conflict with others. And the sovereign comes to his side in order to uphold his fundamental rights. Uh, and the Bill of Rights that was finally formulated in, in 1689 was a, a summary of all those common law uh, principles which reside in the fact that the individual in the common law is sovereign over his life uh, and um, over a whole area of it has complete freedom of choice. Uh, and I think our freedoms as we have come to enjoy them uh, and as they were formulated in the American Declaration of Independence uh, and in the American Bill of Rights, those freedoms grew in that way from the, from the bottom-up jurisdiction of the common law. They became our fundamental rights. That was our attempt in the English-speaking world to define exactly what this natural law consists in. It consists in the fact that we have these fundamental rights which give us sovereignty over our own lives. And that means that we can affirm them against those who would encroach upon them, including the state itself. They are the things that we can affirm against the king uh, and affirm against anybody who wrongly encroaches upon our uh, sovereignty. Now that um, idea uh, is obviously a very noble one, but it, it is one which automatically is at uh, odds with the modern state because it grants to the individual uh, privileges which the state, which, which limit the power of the state and make it very difficult for the state uh, to organize society according to any vast program for its reform. In the 20th century, as we know, socialism came to be, come, came to be not the, the norm, but one of the major forces that were, uh, was fighting for control over the societies of the Western world. And the socialist view of politics is very different from the view that we conservatives have, uh, and certainly very view different from the view that um, Janet rightly attributed to Edmund Burke. Uh, the conservative view is that, uh, that politics exists in order to maintain peace uh, and the rule of law uh, and permit civil society to develop and to grow and to flourish according to its own natural logic. Civil society is the end. Politics is just the means to ensure that it doesn't grow out of control, to keep boundaries, in other words. For the socialist, the purpose uh, politics has a purpose uh, and a goal of its own. It's not there to permit the development of individual uh, goals through the uh, civil association and the little platoons and so on. It's there to remake society according to a new model. The new model is one in which it, the equality of, uh, of all will be the, the ruling principle uh, and the liberation of, the, uh, of previously oppressed minorities uh, will be one of the means to achieve this. The state has, in other words, a, a vision of the end point to which it is directing uh, everything and law has to answer to that vision. So it, it has the right to override uh, the individual sovereignty in the, in the process of producing this new society. That, that vision, interestingly enough, is already there in the 1945 Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was um, brought into being by Eleanor Roosevelt and is the founding document of the United Nations. It begins with a statement of rights which is very uh, close to the uh, um, English-speaking tradition that rights, our basic human rights include the freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of association, the right to pursue happiness in our own way, and so on. In other words, it reaffirms the sovereignty of the individual. But by, uh, I think it's um, number 26 already, you know, that it's got that far suggests that something's gone wrong. Uh, um, but by, by number 26, we are, it's talking of a right to health, uh, a, a right to a rewarding life, a, a right to develop uh, um, in, in, the, in the way that, uh, that um, human beings nat naturally develop and so on. All kinds of rights are being specified which can't necessarily be achieved by an individual. 
working alone, uh, they are rights which require uh, the, the, uh, the state to, to enter on the individual's behalf and re divert resources in his direction. Uh, and, um, and we've seen this, uh, the, these new rights, which are essentially claims against the public uh, purse, to, uh, uh, we've seen them grow in recent years uh, under the impulse, uh, under the influence of things like the Human Rights Commission here, uh, and uh, the, uh, the working of the courts, in particular at the European Courts of Human Rights in, in Europe. Uh, and there have been two particular uh, uh, ways in which this um, development has, has um, advanced rapidly in recent years. One is the, through the idea of non-discrimination. Uh, the right to non-discrimination is something which um, is not there, of course, in, in the uh, traditional Bill of Rights or in the American uh, Declaration of Independence or Constitution, but it is... Um, something which the, is recognized by the European Court of Human Rights and has therefore been written into our legislation under the Human Rights Act in, in Britain. It means that to, uh, in any privilege that's, that's um, granted or any contract of employment, uh, it, it becomes actually a criminal offense to discriminate uh, on grounds of, and then it, it's an open-ended list in, of race, sex, ethnic, identity, religion, uh, um, sexual orientation, uh, uh, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and the courts, of course, constantly find new ways uh, of affirming that uh, somebody has been discriminated against. So far, nobody has been able to prove that um, non-discrimination clauses protect conservatives. Yeah, um, uh, but we are, in fact, the only group that is regularly discriminated against. Everybody else ha has the privileges of this law. And I think the result, of course, is a, 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 a massive intrusion into the in sovereignty of the individual on behalf of the creation of a, of a new kind of socialist uh, uh, order. But um, th there's a, another uh, way in which the the idea of human rights is being expanded beyond the uh, idea of beyond the realm of individual sovereignty, and that's through what I would call the offence machine. You know, uh, we we all know that freedom of speech uh, means that uh, people say things which are quite offensive. Uh, and we've had examples of this. Obviously, um, people make racist remarks and sexist remarks and so on. Um, uh, and uh, this could be part of the ordinary banter of, uh, of um, friendly conversation, but, or, but there's always a, bar a, a line over which it shouldn't step. Uh, and um, uh, then, of course, when people overstep that line, have they committed a crime or not? Uh, and... Uh, uh, modern courts and, and modern commentators uh, are increasingly worried about this because, uh, of course, in an egalitarian society, you don't actually know whether you have been insulted or not. Um, you know, uh, b just to point out that you're an ordinary example of the human species is, to me, an insult, but I keep quiet about it. <laughs> Uh, but anything that can be said can be taken as an insult. Who is to, de who is to determine who is, who is insulting whom? And when should that be a crime, if at all? Obviously, the common law has dealt with this over centuries. Uh, sedition has always been a crime, uh, a common law crime. Um, and so is incitement to violence. Uh, and uh, John Stuart Mill, in his famous book on liberty, uh, makes a clear exception for those sort of things, uh, saying something which is actually intended to incite people to, uh, to murder or whatever uh, has always been a crime in English law. But uh, things that you say can have bad consequences, even if you don't intend them. Uh, you know, uh, I can say, I wonder whether uh, Muhammad was really inspired or really um, given words directly from the Almighty, uh, and that might proceed, uh, produce a riot, uh, regardless of my intention simply to open uh, uh, an interesting topic of discussion. But it's not my fault. Uh, and yet, uh, of course, as we know, uh, there's an extraordinary ability of people to take offense when it suits them. 
uh, and, um, uh, and to indicate that, that, that this offence has occurred, even before they've fully fe felt it. <clears throat> Being offended is a dramatic uh, capacity of human beings. It's a histrionic ability. That has to say that you, 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 if you begin by pretending you're offended, then you see you've got the response, then you feel you are really offended. And eventually, you're, you're wor you've worked yourself up into a state of anger which you cannot yourself control. Um, that's your problem, of course. But uh, uh, in the modern world, um, the well-meaning liberals w w wish to make it the, the problem of the person who, who first started this process going. So we have a lot of uh, uh, people coming to courts, especially in America, saying that, that they have felt offended or insulted as a woman, as a gay, as a Muslim, and so on, uh, by this or that pronouncement, uh, and that the person concerned should be either um, uh, uh, forced to pay a fine or, or in some way criminalized. And that, I think, is one of the, thing, uh, the uh, issues which is becoming more and more serious, because although it may not lead to uh, legislative <coughs> uh, uh, pronouncements like your Section 18C, it is still there, active in the imagination of the courts and active in the imagination of the journalists who report on things, and also active in the uh, imagination and the fears of ordinary people. People begin to censor, censor themselves. Self-censorship is now a very important feature of our public discourse in the West, uh, in, not only in, um, in newspapers, but also, of course, in universities and so on. And um, this is amplified, uh, again, from the left by the invention of a most extraordinary concept, the concept of the phobia. You know, when uh, um, Islamists first started blowing up innocent people uh, on uh, trains in Europe, <coughs> Uh, um, you know, after a short um, period of shock, people began asking the question whether, you know, there might be something wrong with this religion that seems to legitimize that kind of act. Immediately, uh, and this came especially from the left, was invented the concept of Islamophobia. You know, the, the, the fact that you react in this extraordinary way um, to, to a whole group of people on the, ground, uh, on the strength of, uh, of a crime committed by only some shows that you've got something wrong with you. you know, a phobia is, after all, a, a, an uncontrollable psychic disease. Uh, and um, criticism of Islam is rapidly becoming uh, uh, ca castigated under this label so that people are more and more afraid of actually engaging in it. Um, uh, and you see this, uh, uh, of course, in, in the pronouncements of the American president around the, the, uh, the bombings in Boston and the murders uh, uh, in, in the military by, by Muslims. The, the, the idea, the, the fact that these, uh, the criminals responsible were Muslims who are actually doing the thing as a, an expression of their faith is not itself mentioned, because that would hold you accused of Islamophobia. Uh, then there is, of course, also the invention of the uh, expression homophobia. Uh, now, obviously, lovers of Greek hate that word anyway because of its grammatical incompetence, but, uh, and one would never use it but, it, but it's now become a commonplace. It's almost, uh, almost again, a legal term. Uh, it, it means that any attempt to raise the issue of whether homosexuality is the same kind of thing as heterosexuality, whether uh, homosexuals should be given uh, rights of, of this or that kind, uh, whether, they, whether the, there should be such a thing as gay marriage, all these issues which are extremely important when you think about it for the future of society, given that um, uh, to date at least, children have only come into being through heterosexual union. Uh, you know, these, um, these issues are not discussable. And our politicians won't discuss them for fear of this charge, uh, a charge which has no meaning uh, except that, uh, that somebody doesn't want you to discuss something. You know, you are not allowed to discuss homosexuality as it is, uh, as a social phenomenon, and to draw any conclusions other than those which have been uh, dictated uh, by the gay lobby itself. 
which tells you that to go against these things is to, is to be guilty of homophobia. Now, of course, if you're a free spirit, you don't mind being guilty of anything. Uh, but, but most people are not free spirits because most people have a job that depends upon, uh, upon the opinion of others. Uh, and uh, um, the more your job is in the state sector, the more dependent you are. Uh, and if that means that uh, university teachers and school teachers who are in our societies are, to our cost, state dependents, uh, have to be very careful about what they say. Uh, but it's only in universities that free speech actually is the most important, uh, the, fun the fundamental virtue. It's there that these things get discussed. If they're not discussed there, they're not going to be discussed anywhere. So the fact that university teachers are under pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to shut up about these great issues like the nature of Islam, uh, the nature of homosexuality and so on, uh, and what kind of society uh, we will be advancing towards uh, uh, with um, these lobbies active within us. The fact that you can't discuss them in universities means that they don't actually get discussed. And I, I think this is a, a, a serious problem. And it's one reason why one has to be grateful for the existence of think tanks like this, uh, which, you know, just looking around at you, obviously uh, has not only secured a great deal of uh, support, but also support from quite determined and curmudgeonly people who are not going to be bullied around. And I think this is uh, something that, that is a, a great credit to IPA. I wish we had more like this in, in Britain. But um, I, I wanted to say, just to, in conclusion, one or two things about the intellectual life. I'm not sure, have I got any time? Five minutes, excellent, right. So that was just by way of saying that, that even without the uh, human rights machine, we do have this uh, uh, growth of a culture of intimidation and the sense self-censorship that goes with it, uh, which is making it increasingly difficult to discuss the real issues that confront our societies. Um, but there is another um, problem that we have to deal with. And as a, a former university professor, I, I became very aware of this. The, the problem that, that um, the academy has been invaded by a new way of, a new form of study. It used to be the case that um, at, at universities you uh, were teaching a recognised subject with a recognised curriculum uh, and you were carrying out research or, or scholarship in the humanities uh, which was open-minded, um, guided by the pursuit of truth and, and um, not p dismayed particularly if it came to surprising or unorthodox conclusions. Now, um, one of the first things that, uh, that happens when a, a totalitarian government takes over is that the universities are cleaned up. As I say, people who are doing that kind of thing uh, get thrown out. This is what happened when the Nazis took over the Ger German universities and when the Soviets took over, the, the communists took over the, the Russian universities. Uh, and it was the case in Eastern Europe in my day, with the sole exception of Poland, which had universities which were the only universities uh, where every uh, uh, professor was on the right. Uh, that was because the communists were everywhere. But, uh, but uh, on the whole, this is the first move that the totalitarian mentality makes to stop that kind of free-minded, open scholarship in pursuit of truth. But um, so we, we all have been lucky in inheriting universities of that kind. But is it the case that we still have them? Uh, we, we have seen the growth of an extraordinary number of new subjects in the university uh, in which it, the pursuit of truth seems to be secondary to something else. Uh, the other thing being the pursuit of some kind of political conformity. Uh, if you take a, a subject like women's studies, um, uh, now, I know this is a controversial issue, but perhaps it can be talked about freely in this room. You can't talk about it freely in America, on the whole. Uh, anyway, there, there is a subject. It's very difficult to imagine that you would succeed in that subject if you didn't have, either at the outset or certainly in the conclusion, feminist opinions. 
You know, there is a, uh, it's a subject constructed around an ideology. Uh, it might be that this ideology is grounded in truth, who knows? But to question it uh, is something which uh, is essentially uh, made impossible, both by the curriculum and by the way of teaching it. And I think you'll find that there are quite a lot of subjects like that growing in our universities in which uh, conformity to an orthodoxy takes precedence over intellectual method. Uh, and it may be that, um, that there has to be something like that. As the, uh, you know, maybe, after all, in the, middle, in the Middle Ages, maybe theology was like that. Uh, it, but the interesting thing about medieval theology is that it encouraged the intellectual method uh, despite its requirement of orthodoxy. We are now going through a time when truth itself seems to be increasingly marginalized from, the, uh, from academic scholarship. Uh, uh, it, the, and I think there is one particular influence here, which I would like to conclude by mentioning, which is the influence of those theorists who actually say that truth isn't something which, which we can re rely upon at all, because it is a historically given thing which changes with the, uh, with the power structures and structures of domination of the society in which it is uttered. The, the most important figure here, as you will know, is Michel Foucault, uh, who saw all his work as, as giving us a histoire des vérités, a history of truths, as though truths have a history. You know, something is either true or not true, but nevertheless, he wanted to re rearrange the whole curriculum in such a way that when studying the thoughts of, uh, and writings of people of the past, we're not really interested in the truth of what they say, but in the power that speaks through it. That the only commodity in the intellectual world is power. Who has dominion over whom? Uh, and that way, of course, you can turn any subject, uh, however impartial it seems in the outset, into an instrument of uh, ideological conflict by saying that, you know, to date, English studies has been an exercise of male power over the female gender. So I'm going to turn it upside down and make it an exercise of female power over the masculine domination. You know, and you can turn all the subjects of the university upside down, rearrange them as part of the agenda of liberation, and that way think that you're still doing a scholarship. And the interesting thing is, of course, that you can then call upon a mass of fake scholarship and fake philosophy to give you authority. And that is something which I have written about in, in my more theoretical works. It, uh, the, the, the growth of the, uh, of the fake scholarship industry, which enables people to claim authority uh, for nonsense. Uh, uh, and the purpose of that nonsense being that it, it makes conformity to orthodoxy the only thing that you have. Uh, if the scholarship is nonsense, what is there? Only the conclusions. And those conclusions turn out to be the usual uh, uh, liberal axioms from which you actually begin. So there is my little overview of where we've got to in the um, debate over, over freedom of conscience and freedom of speech uh, and uh, why it's it f uh, fundamental to our civilization uh, and why it is now threatened. Uh, thank you.